I first got involved in this project through the course of my research on girls and performance in early modern England. So I was working on girls as lute players, girls as actors, girls as dancers and performers of different kinds. And now I'm interested as well in girls as owners of books. It's a whole new way of looking at history than in musicology than we did in the 60s and 70s. People just couldn't imagine that these women would own these books or women would sing from these books. It's an interesting manuscript um, simply because of this rather curious inscription of Mistress Anne Boleyn now thus. Otherwise, it's, it's a fairly common uh, uh, collection of French songs and, and, uh, and, and Latin motets. Um, not particularly remarkable, when you pull it off the shelf, uh, it's, it's about that big, um, a, a, a horrible 19th century binding. But then when you open it up, uh, it begins as a rather luxurious um, amateur production of some, some lovely French motets. And then you get some blank pages and then different hands. I was interested in this book in the first place because it, it bears the name of Anne Boleyn. She's a controversial figure. She's a figure that, that people even admire, a non-noble who took on the establishment, kind of that American ideal that anybody can make it. In her day and age, that was very, very difficult to do, almost impossible. There's a lot of work out there on grown women as patrons, as authors, but I felt that there was a piece of the puzzle that was missing and that there wasn't enough attention paid to their education, to their girlhoods. And for Anne Boleyn in particular, we think of her in terms of her grown-up reputation, her great reputation at court, her strength of character, and then her tremendously dramatic downfall. But what we don't know as much about are those years that were spent on the continent and in France, the years that really shaped the woman that she became. The manuscript tells us many things about Anne Boleyn that aren't immediately apparent from her adulthood. The music is from the continent, and so it illuminates a whole aspect of Anne Boleyn's childhood that uh, has been given less attention. The fact that she spent so many years uh, first at the court of Margaret of Austria in Mechelen in Belgium, and then at the French court at Blois, and that she was completely fluent in French, and that she'd been given this incredible continental European education. Their singing was very much part of their daily life. It was very much expected for a young girl of that social background to know music and to be able to perform it. But it was also a really pleasant pastime. They were singing motets. Now we don't have much of a record of women singing motets. Motets are church music and they're normally sung by men, professional choristers. That's why people would say it's very controversial that women are singing a music that's in the male milieu. The music manuscript is filled with songs about childbirth, about courtship, about the importance of marriage, the importance of genealogy. So in that sense, it's an education. But at the same time, the process of singing songs from the manuscript would have brought the girls of the court together in a way that was less formal and hierarchical. This manuscript tells us that Anne Boleyn as a little girl is surrounded by powerful, wealthy, noble women. And what impact does that have on her? She sees how they are. They become queens. Maybe she should be queen. This totally inspired her to want to rise above her station. The music is, for the most part, religious in nature, although there are a couple of popular dance tunes uh, as well. So it gives us a picture into an extremely uh, devout, uh, extremely religious uh, childhood, uh, great devotion to the Virgin Mary, and um, also a very doctrinaire Catholic childhood as well, which is interesting and ironic given her future role uh, in the Reformation, the religious Reformation in England in the 16th century the one chanson, Jouissance, by Samisi. It's the subject matter of that, of that chanson that's intriguing. 
because uh, it essentially says, uh, I will give you pleasure, my love, um, and goes on to elaborate on that and then to end, but remember all good things come to those who wait. Precisely Anne and Henry's situation uh, in the late 1520s. This songbook is French, it's for a marriage or wedding, and it seems that it was made for Marguerite d'Alessant or Louise of Savoy. And then it was given to little Anne Boleyn. In 1521, she's recalled back to England for a marriage herself, and it seems to me that this is when they gave her this as, as a memento, a gift. Because obviously the girl was musical, we know Anne Boleyn was musical throughout her whole life, and so I'm sure she adored, adored this music. Up until now, the top uh, scholars of French music, um, I mean, very eminent professors, are saying, what makes you think that this book has anything to do with Anne Boleyn? And I would think that having the inscription in early English hand might be enough, but what we're able to do now is show that there were definitely English hands in this French manuscript, thereby really implanting it in England after Anne returns. What's interesting about the manuscript and its contents is that it's got uh, what ostensibly would appear to be church music, motets, which would replace parts of the mass or parts of the vespers service. So it would appear at first glance to be church music uh, sung by ma male voice choirs. Uh, but of course this manuscript is for and by women. So that music, because of its context, it changes the performance practice. what Jascan may have written expecting it to be replacing an antiphon in a service uh, ends up being domestic sacred music and that's what's interesting about this book. Most concerts are just all the early music we'd like you like to perform for you tonight. So having this sort of themed concert was uh, interesting, I think, for the musicians. Putting it in cultural context, many of our singers sing in choirs every Sunday and had sung some of the pieces. The Jean Ave Maria is one of the greatest hits of the Renaissance. They'd have sung it in church, but here it is in a completely different context. It's not church music anymore. It's a private devotional music. It's not necessarily a big piece of choral music that's got to fill the whole church. It's just a little chamber music piece. So I think that was a new thing, and I think we all enjoyed looking at this cultural context and having it uh, put into perspective like that. There's over 40 pieces in the book, and we were, you know, doing an hour-long concert of maybe eight of them. So we uh, ended up, there were certain ones where the text really jumps out. For example, in Ilo Tempore, it's the text that's used uh, to tell people not to ever get divorced. What God has put together, let no man put asunder. And Anne Boleyn, who at least in the popular imagination is seen as having bullied her boyfriend into divorcing his first wife, it seemed uh, irresistible for us to do that one. Not least of which, it's a beautiful piece. I love Jouissance vous donnerie and, and its backstory. Um, there's a famous picture, a uh, very famous series of pictures by an uh, artist who's known as Master of the Female Halflings, about the same period, uh, but in the Low Countries. And uh, he's got a picture of what appears to be Mary Magdalene. She's got a jar of ointment beside her, which is her emblem, with this tiny little loop, and you can see on the table in front of her. Uh, she's reading Jouissance vous donnerie. What strikes me so much about Anne Boleyn is this incredible disconnect between a childhood that was uh, Continental, as opposed to English, uh, was religious, uh, as opposed to scandalous, 
was quite quiet and sequestered as opposed to intensely public. It's a very different vision of Anne Boleyn that we see, very distinct from the public face of Anne Boleyn with the scandals and the charges of adultery. It's a, a childhood that seems very focused on books, on art, and on music. What do we miss when we focus only on the adult and we don't think about the child that lies behind that adult persona? Thank you.